Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I think questioning, uh, it's hereditary in the Marshall family. <laughs> uh, Beth and I aren't, aren't in our, our van like five minutes before the questions start coming from the back seat. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, they just, they keep coming and coming. And they're two rows back. <laughs> in the ba- they're, they're in the very back. And they keep coming. Hey, 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 where are we going? Hey, hey, hey. It, Hey, can you fix this thing that I ripped off the seat? <laughs> hey, are we going to eat? Hey, are we there? You know, hey, can you turn up the radio? Hey, hey, Dad. Hey, hey, Dad, are you speeding? <laughs> They're in the back row. They, they've learned how to spot the speedometer. <laughs> hey, Dad, why are you being pulled over? I mean, all this, this stuff. <laughs> um, and sometimes I feel like, and I do it, I, I feel like I have to put a moratorium, like a, a quota on all the questioning. Like, hey, let's play a game. For the next 30 seconds, let's not ask any questions. And they're quiet. And they start off like, hey, Dad, how, how, uh, hey, Mom, what if, because every statement that my kids say is, is it ends with a question mark. <laughs> Why? Why? Uh, another question mark. Because I think that's how they're wired. I think, I think they learned that from me. It's in their DNA that, that we question, that, that, that that's, we, every sentence that we form just is, is some kind of question at the end that we want to know. I remember doing that to my mom. And now later on in life, um, as I've gotten older, I, I've started forming different types of questions in my life. And some of my questioning is, is really towards God. And, and I've started to question and really express doubts in, 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 my, in my faith journey about who God is, um, about, about the, his, his word, about many other issues. And, and some of you might be floored to hear me saying that. <laughs> some of you are like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Are, are you not a pastor? This guy on payroll, yeah. And, and I, still, I still struggle with questions. Right or wrong, I, I, I really identify with the guy that's sitting over there that, uh, that I'm asking these questions and depending on what, what it is that I'm struggling with, it can be really disturbing. It, it, it can be pretty heavy stuff that we wrestle with at times. And so we've come to this, this particular phase in, in this critical journey, the series that we're talking about where we all come to this phase sooner or later. Sooner or later, if you're not here now, you will be shortly in this this phase that after we fall in love with God and after we start grounding our life in his word and starting to know him and growing in him and experiencing him, bam, out of left field comes this, this thing that hits us and it's this phase that we're calling today unsettled. And it, it, it is, it's, it's, it's unsettling. It's this phase in your Christian life, in your, in your walk with God where, where you start questioning the things that you wouldn't have dared ever question before. Like, man, what do I really believe? Anybody brave enough to admit that you've been in that phase? Right on. Yeah, because if you haven't gone through it, you will. And if you've already gone through it, you're probably gonna go through it again. <laughs> it seems to be seasonal. And, and sometimes it's a low-grade case of doubt, you know, and, 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 and kind of low-risk, unsettling questions like, does God actually really love me? How do, how do I know that? Did, am I actually forgiven? And, and sometimes some of the questions are, are even like a mid-grade, a little bit more serious. Like, like how, how is science and Christianity, how, how do they reconcile? Are they allies? Are they adversaries? What do I really believe on that deal? And we get stuck there for a while. How do I, how do I rec- and reconcile the supernatural in this realistic, you know, this, this, this rational world that I live in? Some of the questions are even more hardcore than that. And they're like this high-grade, risk, risky questions like this. Is, Christi- is Christianity actually really legit? What if we're wrong? You know, why, why is it that, that God allows so much pain and suffering to go on in this world? What, what, what if Christianity is just a function of where I just happen to live? What, what, if I, what if I'm a Christian because I was just born in the United States? What, what if I was back east, you know, Middle East or whatever, 
and I was born into a Muslim faith, would I be Muslim? Is this just a characteristic of a Western society? Those are hardcore questions. Hardcore, thought-provoking, going through the dredging the bottom type questions, and there's tons of them, tons of them. And, and here's the hurdle, though, that, that somewhere along the line, as a followers of Christ, we've, we've, we've come to believe that you don't ask those questions. Don't, no, 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 no. Don't, don't even start asking those questions. Because if, if you start to wrestle with questions like that, questions about your faith, it may not mean, maybe it does mean that you actually really don't have a faith at all. Maybe, or, 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 or worse, maybe you're not a legit follower of Christ if you doubt and start to question and, and, and have these, these deep struggling issues. Or, or maybe you might feel like, if I ask these questions, I must really be messed up and I've committed the unpardonable sin and, and, and I've asked questions that are off limits. And so I don't even dare admit it because I don't want anyone to know because if anyone would find out that I'm struggling with these questions, then they might say something like, well, you should just give it all to God. Have you heard that statement? I understand the statement. I don't get that. Just give it all. Just turn it all. Don't have doubts. Don't have questions. Don't struggle. And if I tell anybody, maybe people will think that my faith is really, really weak. And so we get roped into wearing these plastic smiles and walking around like, hey, the Christian life rocks, no problem. Everything's good. It rains over there. It's sunny over here. We have all the answers. You don't have any answers. We have all the answers. Everything's going great. I'm not experiencing any problems. Everything's going to be fine. I never question my faith. And there is actually a theological word for that kind of thinking in the Bible. I think it comes from a Greek root, and the word is horse crap. Because it's a lie. It's a lie. And those lies are contrary to God's character. And those lies are contrary to what I read in God's word. So here's the deal. If, if all of our questions were automatically answered, if we never doubted anything, then I don't need faith. I don't. I don't need faith. Because having faith presupposes that we don't have every question answered. So listen, I want, I want to start off our time together and I want to encourage you today. Even before we jump into this passage that we're going to study, I just want to encourage you in case you are feeling horrible about having any doubts, in case you're living in secret that, that you're questioning your faith, if you're, if you're feeling unsettled in, your, in your, your critical journey with God right now, you're feeling lame and you're buying into the lies that I must not be a very good follower of Christ. I, I just, I want to encourage you right now. And so think about this for a second. John the Baptist. Picture him, <laughs> right? A real man's man covered in stuff he killed, you know. I don't know if he killed a camel, but he's, you know, he's covered in fur. He's eating grasshoppers, he's living out. He, he's, he's rough, he's tough. And his whole, whole deal was, was, was paving the way for Jesus Christ to come. That was a whole mission of his life, was it not? And then Jesus Christ shows up, and what's John say? He says, look, it's the Lamb of God. It's, 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 it, it's the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world. He, he, he sees Jesus, and he says that right in the Scripture. And then Jesus comes up, and they have this conversation, and I can't baptize you, so you should baptize me. And John baptizes him. Jesus comes up. Holy Spirit comes down from the heaven as a form of a dove, lands on Jesus, voice in heaven. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. John's there. He sees it all. But guess what? Then he's captured and he goes to prison. John's locked up. And what does this mighty biblical character do? He becomes really unsettled. He's sitting in his cell and he starts to become unsettled. He starts second-guessing this experience that he has. He starts second-guessing, was I really there? Did I hear all that? Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just you know, a trained pigeon. I don't know. You know what, is it really who he is? And he starts to doubt. Now, look at this. Luke chapter 7. This, this, is, this is what happens. Luke chapter 7, verse 18. Just, we're going to look at this really quickly. Verse 18 through 20. And the disciples of John the Baptist told John about everything Jesus was doing. All right? John's, John's in prison. So John called for two of his disciples 
And he sent them to the Lord, sent them to Jesus to ask him this question. So ask, um, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or, or should we keep looking for somebody else? Are you kidding me? Were you not, this is your life's work. Are, are you not walking with God, John the Baptist? Did you not run into the Messiah? Did you not witness everything that was going? I'm just kind of, I'm just, you know, I'm just spitting here. Are you the Messiah or should, you know, I just keep doing my deal? Verse 20, John's two disciples found Jesus and said to him, this is really interesting. Um, we're not really asking this, um, John. John's kind of, he's asking this question. We just want to make that sure. That's what he says. John the Baptist sent us to ask. Are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we just keep looking for somebody else? Are, are, you, are, are you kidding me? So John's sitting here, he's, he's in prison, he's rotten away in prison, and, and now, he, I mean, he's the guy that stood up for Jesus, he's the guy that paved the way for Jesus, he baptized Jesus, he was there in the situation, and now he's, he's unsettled. He's struggling with these doubts and these questions. What's, what's incredible about this passage is not that, that John doubted, which is very encouraging to me, but what's really incredible about this passage is Jesus' response and this isn't on the screen, I'm just gonna tell you. Several verses later in verse 28, here's what Jesus' response was. I tell you, and this is the first thing he said, I tell you, among those born of women, there's no one greater than John. Seriously. Anybody refreshed by that? <laughs> Does that not put wind in your sails? <laughs> Jesus is, okay, right in the middle of, of, of John's little episode of doubt, Jesus says, no, there's nobody greater than John. I'm not taking offense at what he said. I praise John because, because he's, he's displayed doubt. He's been obedient. See, I, I think we get hung up on, on the fact that we think that God wants us to be superheroes, you know, that, that he wants us to have this faith, but... I need to tell you, I don't, think, I don't think God is surprised. From everything I see in Scripture, I don't think God is surprised when you and I start struggling in our faith. Because everything that I see in the Scripture says that God doesn't want this pseudo-relationship with you. He doesn't want us to just, you know, become, uh, dumb down our brain power when we come to Christ. He made us. I think he wants us to express our doubts to him. Are you doing that? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm having my fair share. Are you expressing your doubts and your questions and your struggles and the things that unsettle you to God? Because maybe, I, and I'm guessing, there's quite a few of you in here right now that are go going through this unsettled phase in your walk with Christ, and, and maybe you're afraid to admit that you're actually in the phase. You can't reconcile some of the stuff that you're struggling with. You're wondering if there's something wrong with you. Um, oftentimes when we're in this phase, we feel extremely lonely. And it's pretty confusing. And can I just say, <laughs> welcome to K2. <Kate> <laughs> You're in great company. You are in great company. Because it's here that we celebrate that struggle. Struggle away. Be unsettled because I think it's the very unsettling that helps you break through in your faith with Jesus Christ. We need a transition here. I, 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 love, to, I love to scour uh, the scriptures that, that we think are fairly um, normal, uh, you know, that we've read a lot, that we're very familiar with, and I like to find the little tidbits that we, we skip over sometimes, that we gloss over and pick out those nuggets. And so today is one of those occasions. I wanna go to Matthew chapter 28. Some of you might recognize that passage as being, we call it the, the Great Commission, right? It's that passage where Jesus says, go, make disciples, baptize them. It's this missional passage where Jesus, he's getting ready to ascend back to heaven, right? He's, he's died, he's risen from, and he says, go, do it, carry on the church. And then he ascends back to heaven. And that's where, bam, the church takes off. And the rest of the New Testament is this great story of the new church. That's the passage, and it might be familiar to you. But even before getting to the Great Commission, there are some unsettling, unsettling themes that we find here in, in Matthew 28. And starting in verse 16, let's take a look at these together. There's a couple of observations here. Then, then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. 
Okay, again, at this point, Jesus has already uh, risen from the dead. He's appeared to them in the upper room. He's been there. They've, they've seen each other. It's the disciples. They go, and he says, meet me, on the, meet me on the mountaintop. Okay, that's the situation. Verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped. But <laughs> some of them doubted. Okay, if there's any time that you're not likely to doubt, it would be this moment because you saw a dead guy come to life, right? I mean, these guys were in the upper room. Jesus is like, okay, I was dead. You saw me being crucified. I rose from the dead, walked through a wall, came into the room, showed you my hands and my side, spoke to you. I was there with you, and then I appeared all over the place, and then we came back, and here I am in the mountain. Some of you worshiping, and maybe even those who are worshiping are doubting. I mean, these, these, guys, <laughs> these guys were living with Jesus. They were, they were with him 24-7. They were captivated by him. They, they walked side by side with Jesus. They saw all the countless miracles that he had done. They had hours and hours of teaching they, they were privy to. And, 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 and they, they lived life with him. They witnessed him being crucified. They were there when he rose from the dead. And yet they still doubted. Here's the first major observation of this passage. Doubting. Having questions, being unsettled in your faith is, ready, normal. <laughs> Does that not feel good? It's normal. Because see, if we're really gonna understand this unsettled phase in our journey with God, we've got to understand that doubt is not opposite of faith. It's the predecessor of faith. Let me say that again. We've got to understand that doubt is not opposite of faith. It's the predecessor of faith. In other words, in order to get into the house of faith in your relationship with Jesus Christ, you've got to go through the front door of doubt. Because no one, no one can experience faith without going through doubt. Um, the great C.S. Lewis himself, what an amazing writer, great theologian, you know, a lot of his writings were centered around this whole entire topic. In fact, one of his most famous writings, The Mere Christianity, was this whole entire book of, of, of his personal stages just being unsettled in his faith. And he brings up really incredible questions to unsettle the reader because he had been there. And I'm telling you, if you are in this phase of being unsettled, you have got to pick up that book. Another amazing book that, that would be something I would just encourage you to grab is, is Ravi Zacharias, one of the greatest thinkers of our time wrote this book called Who Made God and Answers to Other 100 Tough Questions of Faith. <laughs> it's not a light read. Because we've got lots and lots and lots of questions. Why? Because doubting and having questions and being unsettled is just part of the human condition. And if people tell you that they never doubt, then you can tell them that you don't think they're thinking. <laughs> Please don't send me emails about that, all right? If people tell you that they don't doubt, then they're not really thinking. Why? Because God made us, God made you and me with this insatiable desire in our, our minds that we're not satisfied until we fully understand something. We want to take our brain power, wrap it around it, and dissect it and get our answer and finally come to the place where we understand. But here's the crux. I can't do that with God. I'll never fully understand him. That's why it's so difficult. I don't understand what he's up to. Uh, this side of heaven, I've got so many questions that, 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 that have preceded me and questions about God's character and what he's doing in my life. And sometimes I don't even understand that my story is part of this bigger story of God and I don't even get that. And as we pull back the layers of our faith, our journey starts to be challenged when we start challenging the preconceived notions of who God is. And I'm confused, and I'm, I'm, I'm unsettled, and I have these questions, and, and it's lonely. And here's the deal. If John the Baptist doubted, <laughs> and, and the disciples who spent 24-7 with, with Jesus doubted, then you need to know that you're absolutely normal. <laughs> wow. Because the more God keeps revealing new things to us, it's necessary in moving us more to, to understanding who he is and understanding who we are in him. Well, Jesus goes on here. 
Verse 17, they came, they worshiped, um, but some of them doubted. Verse 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's almost like an acknowledgement of Jesus saying, okay, I know you're struggling. <laughs> I know that you're, you're totally questioning, you're doubting me, you're doubting what's going on here, and I just need to remind you who I am. I have all authority. Yeah, but Jesus, um, you know, what about that risen thing and coming to life? And I have power. But what about, you know, when we were next to the lake the other day and you were teaching on that one thing? I have power. But what about, you know, when you spit in the mud and you picked it up and put it on the guy's eyes and, you know, and I have authority. Jesus is saying, don't, don't forget who I am. You're doubting, it's normal. And being unsettled, it's normal. But I have authority. Verse 19. This is really interesting here. Verse 19, he says this, therefore, go. <laughs> therefore, go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Disciples are doubting. They're worshiping, they're doubting. They're unsettled. Jesus reminds them who he is, and then immediately after he reminds them, he missionally casts this vision for them to carry on. <laughs> okay, here's, here's the second observation of this passage. Doubting is normal. Second observation, you can follow and still doubt. You, 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 you can be a follower of Jesus Christ and still have major doubt. How do we know that? Because of Jesus' response here. He didn't be like, ah, sorry, you lose, and give them the spiritual boot. He, he didn't do that. He didn't say, hello, you're disrespecting me here. You know, shame on you, you can't be my follower. No, what did he say? He said, let me just remind you who I am. Okay, let's just move on. Therefore, go. I'm using you to spread my good news. You are my, my agent of change for this world. Go. So in this passage, Jesus is literally commissioning people who are worshiping him and doubting him at the same time. So in other words, I can be a deep follower of Jesus Christ and still not have all my questions answered because when I'm on my way to heaven, I'm still not gonna have all my questions answered. Martin Luther um, has this amazing quote. <laughs> he says this, knowledge and doubt are inseparable to man. The sole alternative to knowledge with doubt is no knowledge at all. Only God and certain madmen have no doubts. What's he saying here? Okay, if you don't doubt, you just might actually be a little crazy. You might be a madman because belief and doubt are companions. So doubting is normal. <laughs> you can doubt and still follow Jesus Christ and be missional. Here we are in verse 20. Here's the last, last verse in this section so he goes on to say, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. Ah, oh, here it is. Be sure of this. In other words, you can bank on this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay, here's the, here's the last observation in this passage here. That Jesus, <laughs> he promises his presence to those who question. He promises his presence to, to you if you are uh, struggling with questions, if you're unsettled. He says, you, you're not gonna walk this alone. I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. I'm for you. I'm actually in you. My presence is with you. You're not walking this alone. And I don't know what that does for you, but for me in my life, that brings me un unbelievable, supernatural comfort. Because when I'm in unsettled phases, it's, it's often ushered in by crisis in my life. Oftentimes, I go through a crisis right before I entered this unsettled phase. A few years ago, um, my grandfather passed away in... Uh, I gotta tell you about this guy. His name is Cliff Burroughs. He, he was an unbelievable guy who spoke into my life. He taught me how to wrench on cars. These are really good when you have old, broken cars. He taught me how to, how to build electrical circuits and, and formulas for, for figuring out the amount of ohms and power and resistors. And some of you are like, don't get, and I didn't get it until he explained it to me. And he, he was just wealth of knowledge. And when he died, so much knowledge went with him. And I loved him. He was going into the hospital for just a routine check. 
And um, he never left. And we prayed. I'm telling you, I've never prayed so hard in my life. My faith was never stronger than it was then. God, God's gonna heal him. <laughs> we prayed, we laid hands on him. We, we sang. And it, it was a very rare event that the whole family was able to get together. People hopped flights, got into town. Uh, that's pretty rare. And we stood all around Grandpa's bed. We held hands, we prayed, believing in miracles, believing that God was God. And as we sang, he, he slipped into eternity. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, can I say this? I was pissed. I was really upset. Um, and I bolted um, and went to the very end of Alvern on this road and, and hit the trail. It was at night and the full moon was out and I just started hiking up my favorite canyon having this conversation with God. God, what are you, what are you thinking? I mean, seriously. Should I not have prayed at all? Were, were my prayers ineffective? Were, are you not God? What, what, are you not powerful enough for cancer? How, okay, how are you getting glorified through this one? And I don't, I don't even know what, God, what I expected God to tell me. Like, right then he was gonna say, okay, now that we're alone, Andy, I'm just gonna tell you my whole plan. Here it is. Maybe that's what I expected. That's not what I got. What I got was this overwhelming sense of God saying, shut up and trust me. Shut up and trust me. I have all authority. And I'm telling you, that's the only thing that allowed me to get through my unsettling period. I'm God. You're not. And it seems like sometimes we have these two tracks of life, one track where, where everything is great, my belief is, is strong and everything's going well and then all of a sudden this other track comes along full of doubts and questions, it smacks me right down and suddenly it knocks me off track and I'm, I'm unsettled. You been there? And somewhere along the line, I feel like Christ is, is trying to get me to the place as he did through this experience where, where it requires me saying, I don't know it all. I'm not even sure what, what all of that is, and I don't even know it. But I'm sure about enough. I'm sure about the spirit that lives with inside of me. I'm sure about how I've seen you work in my life and the experiences that I've had. And I'm gonna follow that even when I'm unsettled. Because Jesus is saying, wherever you're at, <laughs> whether you're struggling, doubting, questioning, I'm with you. For how long did it say in Matthew 28? Till the end of the age. All the way. Listen, I don't know where you're at. I, if you're not being unsettled right now in your, in your walk with Christ, you will be. <laughs> if you've not experienced it, you, you will experience it. And my question for you is, what, what, do you, what do you do with those doubts? What are you doing with the doubts? What do you do with the unsettledness and the questioning? You know, are your, are your doubts just slamming you into a corner and just beating you up? Are you, are you allowing them to defeat you? Or are you allowing God to use these very issues to deepen your faith with him? As we close, I, I, wanna, I wanna give you the, the 924 challenge. <laughs> the 924 challenge, and it comes right out of Mark chapter nine. Let me summarize what's going on in this chapter here. The Bible tells a story of a father who, who is dealing with a very, very traumatic situation. It's a crisis that's just totally popped up in his life. And, and, and the issue is, is that his son is demon-possessed. The demon has tried to throw his son into the fire and drowned him, and he, the son is uncontrollable. And so the father, the father comes to Jesus to get his son healed. But Jesus, being Jesus, sensed that there's a lot of doubts in this man's heart. And, and Jesus tells the father, he says, 
that with faith in God, nothing is impossible. And then we get to the, the, the man's response in Mark 9, 24. And here is the response. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I believe, but I have got a lot of unbelief and I need you, Jesus, to help me overcome that. And I gotta tell you, I think that is a beautiful, beautiful prayer and request. This 924 principle is that we start with the belief that we have, we start exactly where we're at, and we ask God <laughs> to help us through the rest of the doubts, through the rest of the uncertainty, to the rest of the issues that are just playing havoc with us. And some of us today, I think we're afraid to do that. Afraid maybe to, to admit to God that I'm, I'm struggling with some issues. Afraid because I'm actually afraid of the, the questions. And, I, and I've come to think that I think there's two different types of doubters. There are some doubters who allow their doubts to win and they bag it. But there are doubters who allow their doubts to be steps of faith into the house of faith. God, help me with my unbelief. Would you meet me on these issues? Would you meet with me with my questions because I'm, I'm unsettled. And God promises he will. And James, he said, if you lack wisdom, you should ask and he will give it to you. Listen, if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today and you, you're getting beat up by doubts and questions, first of all, please know it's normal. <laughs> Second, just, just know that you're, you can follow Christ with your doubts. And then do know that God promises to be with you through it all. Because getting into the house of faith requires that you go through this door of doubt. So lean into it. Lean into it. And if you're here and you're considering, man, I, I don't know if this Christian life, if, if this is the right decision for my life yet or not, can I just encourage you? It's okay. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to have doubts. Oh, it is okay to be completely unsettled. And you're in the right place. Because we're here to stand with you through those unsettling times and to meet you where you're at. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see.